Huh? I'm on? Okay. Okie dokie. Okay, well, it's good to see everybody here. I'm glad to be here myself. I, uh, uh, if I look a little slow, I am. Um, I preached feeling worse. I don't feel bad. I'm kind of getting over something. I had to have a, a uh, x-ray done. My doctor thought I was getting pretty sick Monday, so they had an x-ray done. I had a little spot of pneumonia. He said he believed it was on my lung. So they put me on some heavy-duty prednisone. If I get real hungry and start eating, chew on this. That's <laughs> Prednisone makes you hungry. Won't you? I'll start chewing this paper probably. But uh, and it keeps you awake, so I won't go to sleep during the message. <laughs> and uh, they, they said I had to get on top of it real quick, so they gave me some uh, power antibiotics and uh, Labaquin and 40 milligrams of prednisone, that'll make an elephant well. Has any, have you ever seen an elephant fly? That's what I want to know. Ever seen an elephant fly? I said, in Dumbo. That's where I got that, you know. Christopher comes to the house and he wants to see Dumbo over and over and over. And it drives me crazy. It's just, uh, have you seen a house fly? Every seen an elephant fly. He would watch Dumbo 24 hours a day, a 1948 Disney film in the poorest illustrated drawings. He'll watch that. But uh, I'm doing fine, and uh, I'll make it. Uh, we always start our, our lessons by sharing with you uh, people that call us and write to us from around the country and around the world we are it's hard to believe that the few people as we have here on Wednesday nights and Sunday nights that we'll have that right now we're uh, live streaming all over the world people get us in Russia they can get us in and people watch us in Japan and South America and in Europe and Africa and, and then besides that we uh, we're uh, we DVD everything and uh, we're on TV and about 200 different towns and cities from San Francisco, I mean from Los Angeles and San Diego all the way up to New York and and all over Texas and all over Oklahoma and Arizona and all the other kind of places. Got an email from Wilfred German. He's in Howard Beach, New York. That's in Queens. Watches his own TV there. I wish to thank you for providing deep and true study on the Word of God only to reveal to the elect. I've received the DVDs and study literature to confirm Wilfred German, uh, Howard Beach, New York. Also, what is the channel for Queens, New York, and literature in Spanish? Peace and grace in Jesus Christ, Wilfred. Well, you can go online and Willie's got some. Uh, channel, 70. channel 70. Okay, that's on Channel 70. And uh, Shanna Joseph writes to us in Brooklyn, New York. Watch us on TV there. Praise the Lord. I am thankful that God has exposed me to your teachings. I hope one day we can meet face to face. Can you send me some teachings on marriage? Well, I've got some along the way. And then Will Perry writes from Tucson, Arizona. Hi, Jim and Tom. Sorry to ask such a novice question, but can you define pray in the spirit? Pray, prayer, means to bow to the will of God. Spirit is the truth. When you pray, pray in truth. And pray means to bow to God's will. And does that mean to pray in tongues? No, 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 no. Absolutely not. When Paul speaks of praying in a tongue, an unknown tongue, the word unknown is not in the text in 1 Corinthians, the 14th chapter. It says, he that prayeth in a gloss of foreign language, only he only prays to God because only one person there knows besides him what he's saying, and that's God. And, he, and they had problem at Corinth because at Corinth, that, that was the very focal point of all the world, all world trade travel right here at Corinth, right there on the end of that land bridge going on to the Peloponnesus down here. And uh, that uh, all these different languages were spoken there. He said, don't somebody come into the church talking in uh, Spanish or, or Italian that these people cannot understand. That's what he's saying. Uh, I would love to pray in the Spirit. Well, don't do that Pentecostal stuff. That's a lie. Just 
not sure how really any, any thoughts you have would be appreciated. I've got an entire series on tongues. It's not anything like what the Pentecostals are saying. It's the two words, gloss and dialectos. You know, my grandma was a Pentecostal, and she was in false doctrine, too. And she used to tell people they weren't saved if they didn't speak in tongues. She was ignorant. I don't care if she was your grandmother, and so was my grandmother. Uh, I find that hard to swallow. You're exactly right. I went to First Assembly of God Church in Tucson. That's a tongue-speaking, faith-healing church. All Pentecostal churches are. For a while where they speak in tongues, but not everyone does it. And they don't teach you to have to speak in tongues to be saved either, or at least not at this First Assembly. I thought speaking in tongues was a gift of the Spirit that God gives to some people among other gifts. No, only to the apostles. Hope all is well. Thanks for speaking and doing the truth. God bless. Will Perry, Tucson. I'm not, not, not a put down, Will. I don't have time to fool around. I'm too old to fool around. I just say it to the point, blunt, your grandmother. I'm not saying she wasn't a believer. I'm saying she didn't know what she was doing if she was a Pentecostal. Pentecostalism is an evil, wicked doctrine. Uh, then uh, K.N. from Texas. Um, hello, I wrote to you last Sunday about some problems I had joining the crowd and you stream web page during the broadcasting. I'm sorry for bothering you again, but I'm truly interested to download some of the videos you broadcasted. I was wondering if there was a software to do that from Ustream being Windows XP. I really enjoyed last teaching you posted and I'm browsing many of them. If I could download some of them, it would be great. I was wondering also how can I do uh, what, how can I do to get some of your DVDs mentioned by Pastor Jim during the teaching last Sunday? I'm interested about Revelation DVDs. We've got about 270-something of those. You can get three at a time. Thank you in advance for your dedication, work, and time. Ken from Texas, keep watching. In Bixby, Oklahoma, Mark, he, sends, he supports the ministry, writes regular. Hello, Jim. I know you're an authority on the tabernacle, and I've heard you speak concerning your extensive library. I'm not. A, there's no such thing as authority of any kind when it comes to the Bible. We're all we're all scholars. The word scholar means learner. I picked up a book called The Tabernacle Shadows of the Messiah: Sacrifices, Services, and Priesthood by David Levy. Levy is the word Levi, and so evidently he's a Jew. I was wondering if you had this book in your collection. I've got dozens of books in my collection, but I don't know that I have that. I have to look and see. If not, I'd like to pick one up and send it to you. You're welcome to do that. I'll be glad to look at it. Not because I think you teach an error, but moreover, because I have found this book thus far to be parallel to your teachings. Well, I'm always welcoming another writer that has some understanding of Scripture, in particular the tabernacle. I've also heard you say that you have several books on the same topic because one writer may include something that the other writers fail to detail. That's exactly right. When you... When you're researching McClinic and Strong, and then you're researching Hastings, they don't even read alike. I mean, they, they approach things completely different, and both of them has material that the other absolutely does not have. And uh, I've got McClinic and Strong, Hastings, International Encyclopedia, uh, Smith's, uh, Visitor Singer's Jewish Encyclopedias, Judaica, and about a half dozen, Schaff Herzog, many others. Because you will get things, every writer approaches things according to, it's not just a writer that puts out the encyclopedias, it's 450, 500 contributors sometimes, sometimes a thousand. That's why if you read McClinic and Strong, one article, he might contradict or say something different than another article will say on the same subject. That's because two different writers wrote it. And you have to understand that. And it doesn't mean, because I disagree with a McClinic and Strong, it doesn't mean I dis disagree with the whole book. I'm disagreeing with that particular writer that wrote that article on a point, but I'm not disagreeing with the books. Everybody writes with a prejudicial or prejudged attitude. I do. I write with a very uh, conservative attitude towards everything. Everything has to include predestination, election, the sovereignty of God. It has to have an arrangement. It has to have a definition. It has to meet the criteria. But please let me know if you'd like this edition. I'll be happy to send you a copy for your further studies and teaching. Thank you for long years of study and powerful delivery. I've enclosed a picture of the cover. Yeah, I'd love to have it. Uh, Linda Jamont writes from Brooklyn, New York. Uh, Dear Jim and Mary, just a few lines to say hello, and I'm still thankful for all your teachings. I learned so much from your DVDs. Thanks again. God bless you. Same, uh, Linda Jamont. Then uh, Jennifer Jackson writes, I would like to have my address 
added to mailing list, please. And she's in Nashville, Tennessee. We ought to call her and get her to come visit. John New Royal writes this from New York. Huh? That's who? Oh, is that Robert's daughter? Oh, okay. I didn't think about that. Gosh, I knew Jennifer Jackson. Tell her to come back out to church. Jennifer, get back out here and behave yourself. <clears throat> Not that you're misbehaving, just get over and sit down and behave. And that's what I tell Wendy, don't I? Get over and sit down. Huh? <laughs> All right. John New Roar writes, he's up in the Staten Island. She's in Staten Island, Queens. Am I confused? Staten Island. Staten Island. I get everybody mixed up up there. I don't get John mixed up. I just, I get Staten Island. I know Staten Island is an island. And it's over across the bridge and it's Slugville. Huh? Okay. <laughs> Mary said that, John. I'm telling on her. You get that? You jump their case. Hello, grace and truth. Hope you continue the well way. I thank God for everything. We had fellowship Tuesday night, four souls present, including Dave, Tony, and Eric. It's hard to put into words all that we discussed during the course of our fellowship. We started with the Godhead, the oneness of the Trinity, including verses from Genesis 1, 26, 1 John 5, 7, John 1, 1. Then we just had a general discussion about the lives of the apostles and how they didn't really comprehend what was happening till after the resurrection. The only reason I can read this fast is because I'm on pregnant zone. <laughs> and that's the truth. <laughs> we looked at some of the stories related to Jesus revealing himself to, to them after he rose and how in some instances they had didn't recognize him at first. We talked about how much we have learned and how vital it is for us to deny self, take up our cross and follow him. We love getting together and we thank God he has graced us with this fellowship. God willing, we'll continue in this way. Grace and peace to you all. John, we'll be glad to see you all at the uh, picnic, John. And we are having one, aren't we? And then uh, I got a few letters. I want to read maybe one. Michael Nietzsche writes to us from Charlotte, North Carolina. And uh, dear brother, he loves the ministry, supports it, stays in touch, and uh, has, a, has a couple words to say here. Dear Pastor Jim, Mary, uh, please find and close my tithe and offering for the mission fund if you can. Can you send me a tape on Hebrews? What did Jesus mean when he said, many are called, but few are chosen? Uh, sincerely in Christ, uh, Michael Nietzsche. The word chosen is the word eklektos, elect. Only a few are favored. The whole world is called, few are favored. Few are the elect of God. The rest of them are vessels of wrath, fitted to destruction, headed for hell. Uh, Don Malloy from Knoxville, he loves this message. He stays in touch with us. And he writes, uh, Dear Grace and Truth Ministries, my husband and I have been watching your DVDs. This is from Jessica, evidently, his wife, for two months now and have thoroughly enjoyed them. Thank you so much for them, and please keep them coming. I feel like we've been hungry for so long, and your videos have opened up so many doors. We are truly grateful. I have to admit to you that at first your message scared me. I guess so. But what it actually did was wake me up. Praise God, I have a fear in me for our Lord that I've never known before and finally have the knowledge to investigate the Scriptures is an amazing gift. It's just that if you're elect, all I do is help open your eyes. Just get your eyes open. See, so you can see it's right there in front of your face. There's predestination. There's election. There's God doesn't love everybody. And there it is. I mean, I have spoken to acquaintances and friends about predestination. They look at me like I have three heads. But I'm going to keep trying. Your messages have been an unexpected blessing to us. May God bless you all. Hope to meet you soon with love in Christ. Don and Jessica Molloy. I wish you'd come over to our picnic on the 23rd of June. We have a wonderful time. And uh, uh, I got a letter from Edward Ortiz. He's an inmate in Douglas, Arizona. At the prison there, we get letters from prisoners. And he writes, uh, Dear Jim, hey Jim, hope you're well. I'm doing fine. God willing, I should be released on July 23rd of this year. I've learned so much from your tapes. I would very much like to receive the tapes you have regarding 11s and 2s and 4s and 7s. Those are really interesting. God's sovereignty. I heard you mention them on one of the tapes. Today, 
While reading God's word, I found this in Jeremiah 9, 24. But let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me that I am the Lord, which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. This sure goes well with Proverbs twenty twelve, huh? Hearing the truth about his calling, electing, predestinating, and ordaining us to believe sure helps with making our calling and election sure. He leads us in rightly dividing the word of truth. Blessed be his name. It is always a blessing when one of the lost sheep is found, and I think I've found one. His name is Chris. He is confessing what God's word teaches us. He didn't say he won him to Christ. He said, I found a sheep. And that's what we do. We just go looking for sheep. No free will. God doesn't love everyone. Christ didn't die for the sins of all. We, we don't accept Christ. God elected the homes that he willed to save before the foundation of the world. What a joy to be able to share in these truths with someone other than, other than Matthew Johnson. Matt is well and says hello. And that's Eddie. That's Sherry Johnson's son. So evidently he heard from him. Uh, well, that's great. He said enough truth in this. I know he's watching the DVDs. I know that. All right, that'll be enough uh, reading. I got a couple of phone calls. Tom Murphy, Sunland, California. Malik Herrera, Deerfield Beach, Florida, uh, called. And I got a letter here from a guy that's about half crazy. I ain't going to read that. I, I get some of those. Man, they accuse me of everything in the world. I got a call from a guy today. You son, you just don't know what you're talking about. Billy Graham is a wonderful man, and he said we have to eat flesh and drink blood. Billy didn't say that. He thinks that's communion. I must be wrong because I'm not famous and rich and not tall with a square jaw, you know. I don't have a three-piece suit on. You have to have all that to be right, don't you? Huh? You must. Now, how could these Greek words be right if Billy Graham don't talk about it? And uh, remember our needy people. We, we try to help the needy believers that are part of Grace and Truth Ministries. This is people who've proven th themselves faithful. We try to pick them up and carry them along the way and uh, try to add to their income by giving them gift cards and some offerings at time because we've got some people that are struggling just to keep their head above water. And we need, uh, need you to be considerate of these people. This is one of God's commandments to take good Take care of the widow and the orphan. And uh, if you want to give monthly or you want to give whenever you want to give, you can pick up a food card. Or I call them food cards. They're gift cards. You can pick it up at, at, uh, down at some of the grocery stores or some of the markets. Uh, if you could give, some people don't have Walmarts so that they can't get gasoline with Walmart. Walmart's a good card, but if you can send some visas and MasterCards, 25 or $50, whatever you can send, this is for our needy people, people who are really in need. And every bit of this goes to them. So uh, be aware of that. Uh, don't forget our picnic all day long. Good time, shelter down there, great big fans, uh, plenty of shade trees, lots of fun, lots of fellowship, lots of food. Bring your food, bring your covered dishes. Uh, we'll play some horseshoes and some volleyball. Y'all can play some volleyball, I'll watch. Okay, don't do much playing anymore. But uh, so everybody show up, and meet your pretty faces, and we'll have a good time. Bring your Bibles or bring your concordance, whatever you want to bring. We just fellowship, have a good time with the Lord. Well, let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer. Amen. Vic, where's Vic? Where are you? Hey, Vic, you introduce your friend here, or has he been here? Have you been here before? I've been here before. Have you? About, uh, has it, what was your name? Shay. Shay. Yeah. We're glad to have you, Shay. My brother's a brother. Okay. We're glad to have Shay here. I thought I'd seen you before. I'd forgotten. A lot of stuff. <laughs> I guess these people thinking if they call me and insult me and tell me I don't know anything, that'll make me quit. 
I just think it's funny. You don't know nothing. You're ignorant. You're ignorant, man. You don't know nothing. You, you, you know, talk like that to me. I'm going, I don't. Burns it up for you. When? When? Over the weekend, they shared a room together. When the burn said that he told Dean the stuff he was talking about was true, Dean said he was crazy. Dean said I was crazy. The burn says he took it up for you. The burn knows he's speaking the truth, even though he doesn't do it. Well, did, he, did you talk to the burn? Said he shared a room with Dean. Said I'm crazy. Dean doesn't even believe that. Dean would be, te if you want to see him melt, just be in a room when I walk in, he'll be going, oh, Jimmy, you can't start nothing here. Oh. That's what happens to him when I walk in. He turns into jelly. I think he's, little brother, you're ignorant, dumb. Well, it sounds crazy to a man who doesn't believe God and pretends to, doesn't it? Knows nothing about the Bible. Zero. Zip. My little brother is a heathen. <laughs> That's funny. That really does bother me. I don't know how I'm going to pre preach tonight. <laughs> For mercy, me. Well, if Laverne believes that, what's he doing being a Pentecostal charismatic? That's what I want to know. He's talking about Laverne Tripp of TBN fame. <laughs> Last time I saw Laverne, I walked away from him. I said, I ain't going to talk to you. You're ignorant. He's trying to tell me that the problem with America was homosexuality and drugs. I said, it's in the pulpits. It's the false doctrine. He wanted to fight over it, and I walked away. So it's amazing to me that he would defend me to my brother. It's funny. Laverne Tripp is, uh, uh, used to be a big famous singer with TV. And <clears throat> he's a big old gospel songwriter. About six foot six. Great big guy. My brother don't have sense. God gave a goose, a blind goose in a snowstorm. It was the hardest thing for me to ever admit, though. For years, I used to take up for him. And I realized if you run with the enemy for 20 years, you are the enemy. Most of those gospel singers are scared of me. <laughs> they won't hardly talk to me. It's Wednesday night, and our subject is the history of Israel. We have been teaching through the book of Genesis. We've covered all of Genesis, every character, every event, and much more than that because we've tied Genesis all through the Bible, all through Scripture. We know that the Bible is about a family. The entire Bible is about one family. It started with Adam, Adam, and Adam has a lineage in Genesis, the fifth chapter. This is the righteous lineage of God, or what you'd call sons of God. Sons of God. And that lineage goes down through the fifth chapter of Genesis to Noah. Noah. It goes, from, goes on down through Mahalalel and Canaan and Malil and Jared and Enoch and, and Methuselah and Lamech, and then gets to Noah down here. And Noah's got three sons. He's got Japheth. He has Shem and Ham. And the covenant is established with Shem when they come out of the ark. Blessed be the Lord God of Shem. 
that Japheth will dwell in the tents of Shem, Ham will be the servants of Shem, or his sons Canaan. Canaan, and the land of Canaan is where Ham's descendants were the, this, were the servants of Shem. We get the word Semitic from Shem. Then from Shem, we start with his son Arphaxad in Genesis 11 chapter, and this takes us all the way down to, uh, in that 11th chapter, it begins with the, with the construction of Babel, which is the Babylonian Empire. There was, some people say, 15 dynasties. Some say 31, 32 dynasties. And then this takes us all the way down to the birth of Abraham, well, to his father, Terah, and then Abraham, and Abraham has a son here in the, or Abram is his actual name, his name in the 11th chapter. And then Abram, and, and God calls him out of the land of what we call Iraq to go over here to a land that I'm going to show you. And he says, and you can forsake all your father's land and all of his gods and go here to the land where I'll show you. This is in, in Genesis, the 12th chapter, 12, and then Genesis 17. I'm not going to go through the others. I'm just putting it real quick. I've done the entire outline of every chapter but we're just kind of giving you an idea. Just set it up. In Genesis 15, God says, I'm going to give you a son out of your loins. He's too old to have children. He's 99. Sarah's, Sarah's 89, and they have a son a year later when he's 100. She's uh, 90, and he, she seeks to ovulate and have any, doesn't have any egg, and he doesn't have any sperm or doesn't have any seed. But he has one anyway. This is resurrecting Isaac from the dead, and that's a picture of Christ's resurrection the dead loins of his father, the dead women of his mother. 17th chapter, the covenant is given to Abraham, and he gets the land, and in that same chapter, it's given to Isaac, Isaac, and he skips. He skips Ishmael, and it's given to Jacob, and he skips Esau, and Isaac's second born, Jacob's second born. Uh, I believe that Abraham is second born. We know that Shem's second born, and we know that this went through Seth, who was a substitute for Abel, who was second born. And then we've, we've talked about how that uh, Jacob had 12 sons from Reuben all the way down through Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and, uh, uh, Judah, and all down to Naphtali, Gad, Asher, uh, et cetera, all the way down to Benjamin, Joseph being, the, Joseph being the 11th, Benjamin being the last. And these 12 sons become the nation of Israel. Israel, and then we've, we know the story about how the Levit's son was sold into Egypt. They end up over in Egypt, and Joseph ends up after, a, after an experience with Potiphar's wife where she accuses him of trying to rape her, and he uh, is thrown into prison. Then he interprets the baker and the butler's, uh, Pharaoh's baker and butler who's been thrown into prison, interprets their dreams. The butler is released. Butler's released. The baker is hanged. He's hanged. Because he was guilty, evidently the butler wasn't, or the cupbearer is actually what it was. And then the cupbearer gets out and, and reveals to the Pharaoh who has these two dreams. And he, after he, when he has these dreams, he, he tells him, uh, uh, I've got a man in prison. His name was Joseph. He can interpret dreams. He comes out and interprets the Pharaoh's dream. He's made number one in Egypt. In Egypt. And he says these two dreams, they're going to have, you've got seven good uh, seven good kind uh, going down to the river, seven, seven bad coming up, seven good ears of corn, seven bad ears. He said these are the same dream. It's a seven years of plenty, seven years of famine. This is the two witnesses we speak of in Jewish law. And then uh, they, and of course, when the, all this famine is coming, his brothers come over to Egypt. Joseph finally brings his brothers over to Egypt after some chicanery on his brother's part. And after tricking them but putting the cup in Benjamin's sack and so forth. Well, they all end up in Egypt, and here we are. They are end up in Egypt, and they begin to multiply at such a tremendous rate that the Pharaoh, a new Pharaoh, rises up in Exodus, the first chapter, that does not know Joseph. We're not going to go into that again, Exodus, the first chapter. new Pharaoh rises up because Israel is multiplying so tremendously in Egypt at such a great rate. The Pharaoh says, I'm afraid they'll get so large a nation that they'll side with our enemies when they they'll side with our enemies when they come up against us. So they said we'll put them in bondage. They stay in bondage, stay in bondage 
for 400 years in Egypt. And then God miraculously has a man of the house of Levi have a son. And of course, the Pharaoh says, kill all the sons, kill all the sons that are born to these Hebrews, well, these midwives say, well, we can't do that because they give birth real quickly. They defy the Pharaoh in doing this. They say, they say we, we can't do that because this is going to get something that's righteous. So they, they kill some of them, but Moses is taken and hidden for three months, and then, then uh, his sister Miriam puts him in the river, and he's carried downstream where Pharaoh's daughter, uh, Pharaoh's daughter, uh, she pulls him out of the river and calls him Moses, which means drawn out of the river. And, uh, and then he rises up to be a prince in Egypt there in that second chapter of Exodus, which we've gone through all of this in detail already. Then, he's, then he goes out to see his brethren one day in that second chapter, and he notices uh, two Jewish people, two, uh, two fellows fighting against one another. Excuse me. First he sees an Egyptian beating one of his brethren, one of his Hebrew brethren. And Moses comes down on him and kills him. The next day he comes out and says, and he sees two Jewish men fighting each other. He says, they, and he says, what are you doing here? They said, what are you going to do? Kill one of us like you did the Egyptian? So he knows the word is out and he has to flee. So he goes to the land of Goshen. When he goes to the land of Goshen, that's where he stays for 40 years. He's 40 years old when he leaves the land. 40 years old. He's 80 when he comes back, and now, and he has his, when he's 80 years old, in that third chapter, he has his experience. Now, this is the children of Israel in Egypt. That's what it is, in Egypt, and they're going to be liberated. This is 400 years. We don't get to the liberation just because Moses is here. It doesn't mean the liberation is here yet. Only when Moses takes them out of Egypt, it does the 400 years of bondage cease. And when is that in Exodus? What chapter? Huh? What? 49? <laughs> Who's that guessing up there in that balcony? <laughs> Come out of that balcony, brother. We're going to pray for you there at the altar. <laughs> at the Passover, that is the last of the ten plagues. The Passover in Exodus, the 12th, did he say 49th chapter? <laughs> oh, me. All right. Exodus 12, that's where the 400 years ends. That's when Moses goes. And finally, after 10 plagues, the 10th plague is the Passover. He places the blood of the lamb up on the doorpost, and then he says, when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. That's where we get that. So the Passover, the next morning they leave and go into the wilderness. But we've got to cover this territory between here and there. Now what we've done, we've covered Moses' experience in that third chapter of Exodus. Well, we've gone through a lot there, talking about God speaking to Moses out of the fire, and we speak out of the fire. Out of the fiery trials, we speak the truth. The word of God came out of the fire, and the bush was not consumed, and we speak out of the fire, and we're not consumed. In fact, it refines us. Then Moses speaks and says, Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh? In verse 11 of chapter 3. Chapter 4. We're talking about in chapter 4 uh, how that uh, Moses, uh, in chapter 4, how that God shows him the miracle of the rod. He shows him the miracle of the serpent. He's going to cast the rod down before Pharaoh, and it's going to turn into serpent. He says, Reach down and pick up the rod. Reach out down and pick it up, and it'll become in your hand, uh, pick up the serpent by the tail and become a rod again. And then Moses gives another excuse in chapter 4, verse 10. And Moses said unto the Lord, O Lord, I am not eloquent, in verse, ch chapter 4, verse 10, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am of a slow speech and a slow tongue. Now, we've already said, God's not looking for eloquent people to... to work for him. God is looking for men committed to truth to work for him. He doesn't care about how eloquent you are. He doesn't care how you can polish things up. I've had so many men come here. To the, I said this to a lady in Florida last night. I said, I've had so many men contact me, and they think that what God is looking for is their eloquence and their education. He's not. I've had some men come here or get in contact with the minister, and I'm going to tell you what really upsets people. 
when they think they know and they don't know. They come to grace and truth with this attitude of, I am eloquent and I am round and profound and I need, and I've learned all these big words and flowery sentences and they know very little scripture, they know very little history of Israel, know very little of the word of God. And when they really don't understand the scriptures, they'll come to Nashville or they'll get in contact with us or come here and they will sit back and admire all the information. But when they get here, they realize that this is like an ocean of information. Like, an, like a huge, uh, just tremendous body of water of information. They get up here and they start swimming and they realize that even the people here know more than they know. And they thought when they come here or when they get in touch with us, and this is not one person, this is dozens of people I've had come here that thought they were profound. Being profound here, the Bible says, God don't need a profound person. I, you can be slow of tongue. Your tongue can sound stupid, but God uses a man that's faithful. And I believe what happens, people get here, and they start trying to swim in this tremendous amount of information that we put out here, and it bothers them because they can't swim in it. And even the layperson here knows more Scripture after sitting here for four or five years than they know. And it's like being in an ocean. They're just paddling for their life, and they just it becomes overwhelming to them. They swim to the shore, and they start cussing the ocean. You understand what I'm saying? They start cursing the information. Ha ah, ha! You're just uh, uh, Jim Brown. You 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 you're. You think this is some great thing that you're you've got these books and and this knowledge? No. That's been 57 years of study. I'm not trying to be profound. I'm trying to learn the truth and teach it to people. I believe they just get to drowning in it, and they want to curse the word. I'm trying to paddle in it. It's like I've been teaching on the on the uh, who our mother is on Sunday morning, and I'm going to preach on it again this next Sunday. I'm kind of taking the time off to do that. But it's like when you get into that, I don't want to go through the whole thing, but most of you that were here Sunday morning, in that 22nd chapter of Revelation, you see the throne of God, which is the Ark of the Covenant, and now it's our hearts. And there's this river flowing out of it, and it has the same exact words in the 47th chapter, or the same near exact words in the 47th chapter, Ezekiel. And Ezekiel said, this river that came out of the throne of God, he said, I went out waiting in it, and it was up to my ankles. And then I kept waiting till it was up to my knees, and it was up to my waist. And then he said it was waters to swim in till it was nearly overwhelming me, and that's the word of God. It's like uh, rivers of living waters flowing out of our belly. If you ever think that you've arrived on anything, last Sunday morning will show you that I don't believe I've arrived because I taught some things last Sunday morning I never saw till last week. I've said some things you've seen me teach I learned 10 years ago, some 20, some 30, some 40, some 50 years ago, and some things I learned yesterday. But I saw the thing about the olive tree being the tree of life last week. And it is without a doubt what it is. Now, so Moses says, I'm slow of tongue. Let's continue reading here. Now, therefore, go, in verse 12, I will be with thy mouth and teach thee what thou shalt say. And he said, O my Lord, send, I pray thee, by the hand of, send thee. I pray thee by the hand of him whom thou wilt send. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, Is not Aaron the Levite thy brother? I know that he can speak well. He says, I will let Aaron be your spokesman. I'm not looking for a man with a great mouth to be my anointed deliverer. I want a man that's willing. And I put the willingness in your heart. And also, behold, he cometh forth to meet thee, and when he seeth thee, he will be glad in his heart, and thou shalt speak unto him and put words in his mouth. You go up to him, you tell him, Aaron, tell Pharaoh, God said, let my people go. God says, let my people go. Now, Aaron's the one that's speaking well, and Moses is the one that's telling him what to say. Moses is a picture of the Holy Spirit telling us what to say. Here's a picture of God's interpreter from God to Aaron. I will be with thy mouth and with his mouth, and he will teach you what you shall do. He shall be thy spokesman unto the people, verse 16, and he shall be, even, when, even he shall be to thee instead of a mouth, 
and thou shalt be to him instead of a god. And thou shalt take this rod in thine hand, and wherewith thou shalt do all kinds of signs. That's what it means. When they get in the wilderness, he's going to use that rod. He's going to hold it up to part the sea. He's going to strike the rock with it. He's going to, he's going to, he's going to do everything with this rod that God says to do, and some things he's going to do that he, God said not to do. And Moses went and returned to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said unto him, and he met, he met his father-in-law in that, in that second chapter, and he married his daughter Zipporah. And Moses went and returned to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said unto him, Let me go, I pray thee, and return unto my brethren which are in Egypt, and see whether they will be yet alive. Jethro said to Moses, Go in peace. And the Lord said unto Moses in Midian, Go return into Egypt for all the men that are dead which sought thy life, including the Pharaoh. You see, it was only the Pharaoh that could have put Moses to death. So there's a new Pharaoh here as opposed to when he killed the Egyptian over in the second chapter, isn't there? Has to be a new Pharaoh. So he says, The Lord said to Moses, to Midian, Go return to Egypt for all the men are dead which saw thy life. It reminds us of Jesus when, when uh, they fled the decree of Herod down here in, in the second chapter of Matthew, when they fled into Egypt, they stayed there until they got the message, the men that are dead that sought thy life. And then Joseph brings his son and his wife back up here to northern Israel in Galilee, and they live in Nazareth till he's 30 years old. Mind us of that. Same words in the second chapter of Matthew. So the men that are dead that sought your life, here's another picture of Christ, another picture of the Messiah, another picture of the Holy Spirit. And Moses took his wife and his sons and set them up on an ass and returned to the land of Egypt. Now, God's calling him. He's already had the burning bush experience in the third chapter. God's calling him to call Israel out of Egypt. There's going to be ten plagues. And God's going to harden Pharaoh's heart after every plague. And God says he'll harden his heart after each plague. And Moses took the rod of the God in his hand. And the Lord said unto Moses, When thou goest to return into Egypt, see that thou do all these wonders before Pharaoh, all the wonders that I tell you, not just the serpent, not just casting the rod down, not just putting your hand in your bosom and drawing out leprous and then putting back out, bringing it back out and it's clean. But he says, all those wonders before Pharaoh, which I have put in thy hand. You're going to see all these wonders. He's going to strike the water. It's going to turn to blood and so forth with the rod. This rod is a, it's a picture of the word of God that we strike men with. But I will harden his heart. Who we? God hardened the heart of Pharaoh. He didn't have a chance. He didn't harden his own heart. Now, the Bible says in a place he did, but it's a different word than here. This word harden, I will harden his heart. You get several words for this word harden. You have the words chazak, C-H-A-Z-A-Q, C-H-A. And they're all kind of basic. They're, they're very similar words because they mean to callous, to render stupid. Some of them mean to render stupid by strength. When a man has, when a, the stronger a man is, the less strength he has to rebel against God. What do you mean by that? Physically strong? Well, yes, to a degree, if a man's real healthy and real strong. And he's got the juices flowing through his body and he's got all of this desire for self and the world and things and stuff and money and, and women and men and whatever it is. He has all this physical strength. He's hard to bring down. So God will give a man strength so that he will be hardened. When he says he's going to harden a man's heart, he doesn't mean I'll just strike him hard all of a sudden. He's already planned the hardening ahead of time, isn't he? That's exactly what he's done. Chazak, C-H-A-Z-A-Q. This word chazak, 
in Exodus 4.21 means to fasten or to cease to be strong. Fasten, seize. God ceases him to be strong. I'm going to make him strong-willed. I'm going to make him hard and calloused against these against these gods of Egypt that I'm going to attack. Every one of the ten plagues was against one of the gods of Egypt. And the twelfth chapter of Exodus says so. What Moses was doing or what God had him do was to attack Egypt's gods and say, see if you can get over this. Chazak, that's that word there in 4, 21. It means to be obstinate, fortify. If a man is fortified, he's strong. People have asked me, how do you tell which one of these words uh, this is talking about? Well, they all go together. If you fortify, you make a man strong. If he's strong, he's strong-willed. It fastens him down, and he can't be moved. It means to strengthen self. God, and who is it that strengthens a man? God. God says, I'm going to give him enough strength to withstand my miracles. That's what I'm going to do. And you have the word kasha, a Q, A S H A H. These are all Hebrew words. It means to be dense. We say a man is dense when he's just dull and he's kind of stupid. He won't listen. He's dense, thick. It's the it's tougher something is. It's the less soft that something is. To be dense, tough, severe, severe. Cruel. Cruel. To be cruel. Well, Job said that God was cruel to me. <laughs> Means to be cruel or to act harshly. Well, who gave Pharaoh a harsh heart? God gave him a harsh heart. Look at Job 30. Look at Job 30. Job 30. This is what Job said. Before we get to Job 30, let's do this. Let's read Job 16, 16 verse 12. One of my favorite verses in Job. Job was the richest man of the East, had everything that a man could wish for. Riches, thousands of cattle and sheep and asses and, and seven sons and three daughters. And God literally turned Satan loose on his life but Job said it was the Lord that took away because Satan was God's, was God's sword in God's hand. That's what he was. Job said it was the Lord that took away. Blessed be the name of the authority that took all this away. And he says in verse 11, chapter 16 of Job, <coughs> God hath delivered me to the ungodly and turned me over into the hands of the wicked. I was at ease, Job said. Man, I had life easy. I had all these servants, all these cattle, all these sheep. I was the richest man in the east. And God hath broken me asunder. He broke me to pieces. He hath also taken me by my neck and shaken me to pieces and set me for his mark, for his guard, or for his aim. He said, God did that to me. Now look over here in, in Job 30. Job 30. 30, and here's what Job said God was and did to me. 30 and 21. Thou art become cruel to me with thy strong hand. Thou opposest thyself against me. Job said God was cruel to me. The word is akzar, A-K-Z-A-R. A-K-Z-A-R. He used to act harshly and be violent to me. He said God was violent to me. Now, people don't believe that, that believe in free will. They don't think God would hurt anybody. God says, I hurt people. I kill, I make alive, I wound, I heal. I kill who I want to. I'm God. Don't nobody tell me what I can do. Killed 70,000 in the 24th chapter of 1st, 2nd Samuel because David numbered Israel. And he provoked, God, he provoked David to number Israel. He wanted to remind David who he was before he went out of office. God does as he pleases. Then you have this word, you have this word, A-M-M-I-Y-T-S. A-M-M-I-Y-T-S. means strength or strong. And we'll see some of these words. Strength, so they all have basically similar uh, synonymous meanings. Strong. The stronger a person is physically, 
mentally in this world, the fall is long and hard for him to fall. It takes ripping a man's foundation out front on him before he'll fall. Who is it to make God make men strong? The Bible says in Daniel, the fourth chapter, that God gives the kingdom of this world to whomsoever he will and places over it the basest of men. And a man has to be a strong man to be on the top of the world, to be a president, a senator, a big superstar in the music business, a big sports star. God has to give him that strength. Strength is what makes worldly men not bow to God. Paul said, when I was weak, that's when I became strong spiritually. God has to weaken a man before he'll humble and bow to him. That's to crush him. That's why Jesus came to the bruised. He said, I came to the brokenhearted, to the poor, the emptied out. The poor, the tokas, blessed are the poor in spirit, same word, means emptied out. It means to have the attitude of a beggar standing in the shadows saying, whatever that you would have me to have, Lord. A man won't do that when he's rich. I've said this before. One of my most unfavorite people in the world is Tom Cruise. The guy's an idiot. He's an ignoramus. Test on Bert, what's his name? Uh, Lauer. Tell him, I studied psychiatry, and you haven't, and I know psychiatry, and Brooke Shields doesn't need uh, her medicine for postpartum syndrome. You knucklehead, when's the last time you had a baby? <laughs> what a dummy. When's the last time you experienced feminine, female hormones running through your body? What an imbecile. Telling she don't need medication, she do. I am the expert. Yes, thank you, Dr. Cruz. With his $20 million per picture and his good looks, God would have to break his neck and make it a quadriplegic for him to repent. He's not repentant because he doesn't talk about a daily cross death, self self denial. That man's going to hell if anybody's going to hell. There's a lot of them out there like that, but he's as bad as I've heard. I'd rather a man be an out-and-out -out heathen. I'd rather him be a man would be like Michael Jordan says, I'm a heathen, I gamble, I drink, I carouse, than to be Mr. Nice Guy like Magic Johnson. Oh, gosh, she was, all I did was sleep with 10,000 women, and gosh, I'm a nice guy. And Yeah. I mean, you know, just be honest. Say I'm a heathen. Don't come up being Mr. Authority. Men like that, God has to break them to the ground. They're too strong. That's the hardness of heart. That's what people don't understand. It's not just, God hardness said, oh, I'm not going to let the people go. He was proud. It's pride that keeps a man from humbling to God. God's crushed me. He's nearly killed me several times, put me in the hospital so many times. When I was young, I surrendered and said, God, I give up. And he'll break whoever he wants to break. You've got all these words. This... There's a, there's a verse, people think that Pharaoh is the only one that God hardened his heart. No. Look over here in Joshua. Here's the same word up here, kazak, to fasten or make, fortify, strengthen, to make strong. Was Pharaoh strong? Well, I guess he was. He was the leader of the most powerful army on the face of the earth. Well, did he have a lot of perseverance? Why, Yes. You can't be a Pharaoh without having tremendous amount of strength and perseverance. Who made the man strong to do that? God did. Look over here in, in Joshua 11. Joshua. Joshua 11. Israel's, Israel, the book of Joshua is about Israel going in and possessing the land. They've left Egypt. They're going to they're wander in the wilderness. They're going to wander over there for 40 years, then cross the river, and they're going to start attacking these people in the land that was given to their father 600 years before, Abraham. Over here in, in Joshua, look at Joshua 11. And their enemies are about to attack them. 11 verse 20, It came to pass when Joshua and the children of Israel had made an end of slaying them with a great slaughter, speaking of their enemies, what do you mean? Yeah. No, 11, excuse me. Wrong one. 1120, okay. I thought that was reading wrong. Verse 19, there was not a city that made peace with the children of Israel, save the Hivites, the inhabitants of Gibeon, and all other they took to battle. For it was of the Lord to harden their hearts. That's that same word up there, Kazakh. 
it was of the Lord to make them a strong people. They would be too proud to bow to these invaders of what they considered their land, but had been given to Abraham and his descendants 600 years before. And it had been passed to Isaac, then passed to Jacob. Jacob is Israel, and they're coming back to possess the land that had been given to them many years before this. So it was of the Lord to harden their hearts that they should come against Israel in battle that he might destroy them utterly. Doesn't sound like God loved them, did it? Why didn't Joshua stand up there and say we'd like to give an invitation to him? Just as, come on, won't you come accept Christ? Now the reason Jason laughs, that's funny to him because he's raised a Jehovah's Witness and he's never been around that. That's funny to him. It's not weak. It's second nature to us, but he's, you've never seen that, have you? That's amazing. Huh? Oh, <laughs> that's funny to me. Uh, both Summer and Jason, husband and wife, both of them raised Jehovah's Witness, met each other on the Internet. He says, she said, I'm next Jehovah's Witness. He said, so am I. She said, no, you're not. That's just a line you're feeding me. But he was. And they both had the same feelings growing up about men Jehovah's Witness. But he's not. Now he's a witness and he's, he believes in Jehovah. Uh, that they should come against Israel in a battle that might destroy them utterly and that they might have no favor, but then he might destroy them as the Lord commanded Moses. God doesn't love these heathens. He loved Jacob and hated Esau and he hates all workers of iniquity and only loves his wife, the church, and his church is spiritual Israel. He doesn't love everybody. He didn't love these people, did he? Didn't give them a chance. There's no such thing as a chance. Look at, look at Exodus 7 and 3. Look at Exodus 7 and 3. 7. I'll give you a few of these, and we'll come back, and we'll hit them as we're going through Exodus. 7 and verse, let's read 1, 2, and 3. The Lord said unto Moses, See, I have made thee God to Pharaoh. The word God, Elohim, means a judge. I've made you the judge over Pharaoh. Doesn't mean Pharaoh's worshiping him. He's telling Pharaoh what to do. And Aaron, thy brother, shall be thy prophet. You're going to tell, you're the judge, I'm giving you the judgment, and you're going to tell Aaron to, to what to say to Pharaoh because you stutter and you got a thick tongue and a slow tongue and it sounds stupid. <laughs> Moses didn't sound like Charlton Heston. Good night. By the Lord God, hear my voice. Uh, let my people go. Ridiculous. He was stuttering, uh, 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 brother, brother uh, uh, to tell Pharaoh that God said to let the people go. Uh, he, if he doesn't, he, he's going to turn uh, plague water to blood. Okay? That's all God wants is faithfulness. He doesn't want a great expounder of big $10 words. Thou shalt speak all that I command thee. Aaron thy brother shall speak unto Pharaoh that he send the children of Israel out of his land and I will harden Pharaoh's heart and multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. After each one of the, after each one of the signs up to the, tenth, up to the tenth plague, God hardened his heart because he made him strong and full of pride. That's the, that's the hardening but was he strong before Moses came along? Yes, his heart was already hard. But who made him that way? Who makes a man hard that rises up to the presidency? A man has to be hard and callous because he's got to hurt a lot of people. I don't care who it is, whether it's Obama, whether it's Bush, whether it's Clinton, whether it's Big Bush, or whether it's Reagan, or whether it's Carter, or whether it's Ford. You've got to hurt people when you're that big. There's no such thing as owning a big business without hurting people. You can't have billions of dollars like, like the big guys like Gates and, and uh, what's his name? Warren Buffett and Rupert Murdoch. You can't have billions of dollars. 53,000, 58,000 employees worldwide. Rupert Murdoch, big publisher, and he never hurt anybody to get there? He's strong. He's proud. His heart's hard. If God sets up these men to be there, it's God that gives them a strong will. I've known some people around this town that are builders and developers. They are hard. They're calloused. You can't, I don't, now I'm not afraid of them. 
I know some brokers in this town. I know some bankers in this town. They're hard. But that hardness only goes so deep. The little boy's way down inside, and all that is is a front to put up so that so they want to be exposed. They don't want to be humbled. It's strength that God gives a man to harden his heart, but it was there before Moses came. God hardened his heart before Moses got there, before he even called Moses. He had him in the plan, didn't he? So I'll harden his heart. And I'll multi he says, the reason I'm going to harden his heart is I'm going to multiply my signs and wonders in the land of Egypt. That's why he's going to do it, isn't it? Let me just give you a couple more of these. Look at, uh, look at verse 13 of 7. 13. He says, now I'm not going to go through all this because we're going to cover all this as we go through Exodus. And he cast out his rod. Well, let's read 8, eight down through 13. And the Lord spake unto Moses, unto Aaron, saying, When Pharaoh shall speak unto you, saying, Show a miracle for you. When thou shalt say unto Aaron, Take thy rod and cast it before Pharaoh, and it shall become a serpent. Now, this was instructed to Moses in that fourth chapter, wasn't it? This is what you're going to do. And he threw the rod down, and it became a serpent. And he told Moses, Take it by the tail. Now, no serpent handler ever picks up a serpent. Most of them don't pick up a serpent by the tail other than that crazy crocodile man. He pick up one and like that and swing it around, but I wouldn't advise picking up a black mom and doing that. Uh, but most of them pick it up by the neck so it can't bite them. He said, "Take it by the tail." And Moses showed faith, picked it up, and turned to a rod again. And Moses and Aaron went into Pharaoh, and they did so as the Lord had commanded. And Aaron cast down the rod before Pharaoh. And before his servants, and it became a serpent. Then Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers. Now the magicians of Egypt, they also did in like manner with their enchantments. For they cast down a man, his rod, and they became serpents. But Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods. And God hardened Pharaoh's heart. He made him proud. He made him strong in his pride. That he hearkened not unto them as the Lord had said. Now how did they do that? Probably, Steve Irwin used to say this, the crocodile man. He said, you don't mess with a diamondback rattlesnake in the desert when it's hot out on the desert floor. He said, they strike faster than any snake in the world. 176 miles an hour, I believe he said. He said, you can't get away from one. But he said, if they go into a den and it's cool in there, they will just lay out. You can pull them out and handle them until they warm up. And that's how these snake handlers do in East Tennessee and Eastern Kentucky. They, they take these snakes and they put them in a cold, refrigerated place. And they go out and dance around the churches with them. Then when they start to heat up, they start getting bit, you know. So that's probably part of it. They had discovered this. Now, let's look at, uh, at, verse, uh, at verse 22 here, 22. And the magicians of Egypt did so with their enchantments, and Pharaoh's heart was hardened. But who hardened it? God. Neither did he hearken unto them as the Lord had said. Now, God doesn't want him to hearken. Why? Because he's going to attack all these gods of Egypt. And we'll go through them again also. Each one of these miracles was to test the gods of Egypt. Each one of them. Now, let me give you... Yeah, let me give you another couple of these. Let me give you one that kind of... Uh, kind of bothers some people. Go to Exodus 8. Exodus 8. And verse 15. Now, let's read in verse 12. Moses and Aaron went out with Pharaoh, from Pharaoh. Moses cried unto the Lord because of the frogs. Now, this is during the, this is during the third the third disease, or the third plague, the frogs in the land. This, this begins in the eighth chapter, begins in verse 1, 
goes down through verse 19. This is the frogs in the land. And Moses and Aaron went out from Pharaoh, and Moses cried unto the Lord because of the frogs which he had brought against Pharaoh. And the Lord did according to the word of Moses, and the frogs died out of the houses, out of the, fi- out of the villages, and out of the fields. And they gathered them together upon the heaps and the land stank. And when Pharaoh saw that there was no respite, he hardened his heart. Now, hardened there is not the same word as we find in these other verses. It's the word kabed, K-A-B-E-D. Kabed. This word kabed means to be severe or dull, but who is it that fixed his heart so that he would be strong in heart. It was God that already fixed his heart. Very few times it will say that Pharaoh hardened his heart. It always says God hardened his heart, and then it'll make this exception, but it's a different word. Kobed. Kobed, huh? Huh? He hardened, yeah. Yeah, he hardened. Then he, it's, the uh, word means to be severe, dull, or to make self many. Make self many. I don't know if any of y'all remember. Remember we talked about being vexed with devils? And devil is the word demon. It means demon, demonion. It means, it's our word demon, but it's self. It's, there's no such thing as demons. Jesus rebuked him. He rebuked A-U-T-O. Auto is the word self, and automobile is self-mobile. He rebuked the man, masculine, gender, singular. And we talked about being vexed with devils. There's several words for vexed with devils. It meant they came in great companies. The way a man becomes strengthened is he runs with a whole bunch of evil people. You'll be strong if you'll get into a mob that's against God. Won't you? Get out there and run with people. You're afraid to come against them, even if it's a mob down at the Baptist church, a mob down at the Pentecostal church. You have to be really strong in the Lord to stand alone. And Pharaoh strengthened himself with many, with many. And it means to be heavy, severe, or stupid. Aha, now there we are. He made himself stupid. Remember, there's the word stupid in the Old Testament, brutish. It means to have the understanding of a brute beast or an animal that cannot be taught anything. I've had a lot of animals in my life. I had one old bulldog named Charlie. Whew, it's the dumbest dog I've ever seen in my life. He was a lovable dog. He wouldn't f- fetch. Forget that. He might as well get him to try to teach a calculus problem. And fetch ain't it. You couldn't even get him to come to you. You could slang his head and slang spit every direction, but that's all he could do. And he was lovable, but he was stupid. Couldn't learn anything. Lovable, but stupid. And this word brute beast... Men who will not be reproved, they're brutish, the Bible says. They have the understanding of an anabar. They are stupid. That means they cannot learn. There's nothing wrong with ignorant other than not learning. Ignorant means unlearned. Unlearned. Stupid means you can't learn. Ignorant can be temporary. Stupid is forever. It ain't never going to go away. By our means stupid or dull of hearing. The Bible says the hearing ear and the sing eye, the Lord hath made even both of them. And here means to obey. Here's the word shama in the Hebrew. It is the word akuo. Hoop akuo, excuse me. Uh, akuo, A-K-O-U-O. In the Greek, and it means to understand, and obey is the word hupakuo, means to hear under in the Greek. Shama, obey is the word shama, the same word is here in the Hebrew. Therefore, Pharaoh could not obey because he was stupid. He'd made himself stupid because God gave him a stupid mind. He couldn't learn. He couldn't hear what God was doing. Couldn't even see it right before his eyes when it turned the water to blood. Set and reason it away. Throw the serpent down. Flies all over the land. Some of these guys describe this stuff as unbelievable. Frogs, just billions of frogs everywhere. Disgusting in their food, in their water, in their water sources. It was 
that feces was everywhere, getting sick over it, darkness. And Pharaoh had to be strong-willed. You ain't going to tell me what to do. God of Israel. God made him stupid before he got to that point. God didn't harden his heart the day that Moses came in. He gave him a hard heart till God finally crushed him on the tenth plague. Until God crushes a man, he'll think he's got, I got it together. I got a great future. I, I've said this before. We all start out, I started out as a little boy. I was just humble as I could be. And I got real proud in the middle of my life. And God had to bring me back to a little boy again. That's all men are, little boys, and that's all women are, little girls. There's no such thing as adults and children. They're just children and older children, that's all. You find that out when you get older, that's all. No such thing as, but the older children are experienced and learned. If you want to learn something, ask an old man like Jim back there. You want to know something about life, he'll tell you about life. Ask one of the old guys. Ask one of us old guys that's been around. We'll tell you, but sometimes you don't listen. That's why we don't tell you usually. <laughs> we say, learn it. If you want to know, come and ask me and I'll tell you. But, and then when you begin to get bold in the word, you have a fear of God. If you're bold in life, if you're, you can, I keep saying this, you can't humble to God and men at the same time. If you're humble to men, you're not you're not humbling to God. If you're humble to God, you're not humbling to men. Humble means to level oneself. You'll either level yourself to God or man. You can't do both of them at once. And when you, when you level yourself to God, you'll be bold in the word, and you won't be afraid to say Jesus out in public. I preach everywhere I go, every day. And there was a time I didn't. Didn't when I was young. Too afraid people could hear me say Jesus. Now I realize what I was afraid of was I was embarrassed at the other Jesus, the other spirit, the other gospel that Paul speaks of in 2 Corinthians 11 and 4. I'm ashamed of that other Jesus because he's not the real Jesus. He's Satan transformed into an angel of light. I'm not ashamed of the Jesus I serve, who's the God of the earth. Now, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. I'm going to come back and go through a lot of these. Uh, gosh, there's so many of them I've got here. We'll hit them along the way, but there's... One place we have to go, where would that be? Romans 9. We got to go there, don't we? Romans 9. We, we'll even come back here. Romans 9, one of my favorite chapters in all the Bible. I preach on it all the time. It's the very essence. Predestination is the very structure of all Scripture. Everything is ordained by God in a mathematical fashion. Everything. There's so, there's so many words for this word harden. And I notice that it has to do with strengthening. If a man gets to the top of the world, he can't be toppled unless God does something severe to him. If, if God ever humbled Tom Cruise, he'd have to break his neck and make him a quadriplegic or something along that line. Have to ruin his looks and dump acid in his face. He'd have to cause a crash in the market, make him lose all of his money and, and get... God can do that to a man, but a man that's on the top of the world, how hardly shall a rich man enter the kingdom of God? It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom. You can't get in because you have to repent. Repent means to be turned and think differently, and that's nearly impossible for a rich man. Bill Gates has got $68 billion dollars. That's a million dollars, 68,000 times. What does God have to put a man through to humble him when he has that much money and that much power? Destroy him. You have to destroy him. But he doesn't always want to. He's going to reserve. If your vessel of wrath fit to destruction, God's going to reserve you for judgment. Now, over here in Romans 9, the Bible talks about in Romans 9 about God hardening Pharaoh's heart. And he said he only had one purpose to harden his heart. The scripture says here in verse 9, for this is the word of promise. At this time will I come and Sarah shall have a son and his name is going to be called Isaac. Remember Hagar had the other son, Ishmael, but God didn't even count Ishmael as a son of Abraham. 
And not only this, but when Rebekah had also conceived by one even by Father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, these are twins in, in the womb of their mother, Rebekah. This is Esau and Jacob. Jacob is going to come out second. He's second born. Esau's coming out first. The Bible says, while they were in the womb, before either one had done any good or evil, that the purpose of God, according to God's election, might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. While they were in the womb, it was said unto her, in Genesis, the 25th chapter, the elder Esau will serve the younger Jacob, as it is written in the book of Malachi 1, 1 and 2. Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated, for either one were born, for either one had done any good or evil. This is not nations. People say, well, let's just talk about nations. First of all, what nation is ever built before it ever does any good or evil? How do you build a nation? On evil, don't you? We know that Esau became Edom, but you don't take one step towards building a nation without doing evil and cheating and lying and thieving, starting wars and stealing land. Do you? Nobody does that. You mean we can have a political system and nobody's doing any crookedness building it up? I don't believe that. I've known a lot of politicians around here. Do I trust them? No, not even locally, much less, inter much less nationally or internationally. They're there for two things, money and power. Power should be the first place. And when God makes them powerful, they're hardened, aren't they? They're strengthened. Men with tremendous strength and men with tremendous money, they are hard-hearted. Anybody ever known a rich, I've known a lot of rich people in Hendersonville when I was selling real estate. Never knew one that wasn't hard. When you see them walk into a restaurant, <laughs> that tough look. Wait till God gets hold of you, mister. <laughs> you think you're tough? You ain't tough. Michael is tough. Michael the archangel killed 185,000 men in one night without a gun or a knife. Can you do that? That's better than karate. That's better than ultimate, that's better than ultimate fighting. And people think they're tough. They ain't nobody tough. Even Rusty, who's been a world champion karate guy, he's just getting to be an old man now. He says, I don't want to fight no more. He was heavyweight champion of the world. Dear brother comes here, love him with all my heart. Gentle soul. He says, I'm tired of fighting. He says, no matter how tough you are, somebody's going to whip you. They're going to get you number one day. <laughs> he tells talks about some black guy that kept hitting him over in Memphis in a fight one time. He said, I couldn't see that coming. He said, I was old, getting old and wore out, getting tired. When you're strong, you're hard. I'm talking about when you're strong in the flesh, not when you're strong spiritually. You're hardened. I'm convinced that's what Pharaoh was, and God made him that to begin with. Now, let's continue reading. It was said unto her before either one were born, the elder shall serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob have I loved. Agapao. There's the word. A-G-A-P-E-O. It's the verb form of agape. Agape is walking in the commandments of God. Jacob's name is changed to Israel. Jacob. In the 32nd chapter of Genesis, Israel. And who did God give his commandments to? Jacob have I loved. And loved is walking to the commandments of God, 2 John 6. So he gave his commandments to Jacob and none to Esau. Jacob have I loved. How in the world can men not see this? For God, in this fashion, so, in this fashion, loved. Agapao gave his commandments to the, not everybody in the world, but to the orderly arrangement of mankind, cosmos, that the believing all shall have everlasting life. That's what it says. It doesn't say that whosoever believeth in him. It says in the original text that the believing all shall have everlasting life. Then he says, Jacob have I loved, and I hated Esau, and that's quoted out of Malachi 1, 1 and 2. What shall we say then? Paul is going to anticipate to prove that he's not talking about nations. 
Paul is replying to what he had just stated. What shall we say then? If God loved Jacob and hated Esau before they were born, for either one had done any good or evil, what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness of God? Is this unrighteous? The way Paul asked this question is proof that God is talking about Jacob and Esau when they're womb and hate one and loving the other. Doesn't it? The way he's asking the question. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. I do what I want. I'm God. If I want to hate some people, I do it. That's the majority of the world because few are coming into the narrow way. And many are going to the broad way. And all the many are the non-elect, the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. For he said to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. He said that in Exodus 33 and 9. I have mercy on whom I want to. Don't nobody question me. And I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. It is my business and no one else's. The reason men don't believe this is because they've conjured up a God in their own mind in the world, all the famous Baptists, all the famous Pentecostals, all the... Fame is not what God's looking for. God is looking for infamy. Reproach. Bless you, you when men shall reproach you. Oniedzo. O-N-E-I-D-I-Z-O. Infamous. God's not looking for Billy Graham. He's famous. He's not infamous. He doesn't make a world angry at him. The world has to hate you. If the world hate you, if the world hated me, Jesus said in John 15, 18 through 19 and 20, he said, it'll, if it hated me, it'll hate you. If it persecuted me, it'll persecute you. You have to be hated to be a believer. If you're friends of the world, you're an enemy of God. And that's the truth. And he says that in Exodus 33 and 19. So then, so then, let me conclude something here. It is not of the man that wills, because man doesn't have a will to come to God. There's none that seeketh after God. There's none that understands. All men drink iniquity like water, Job said. Therefore, it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. That's the only thing that gets a man into the kingdom. And he's merciful when he picks out you to be birthed by his will and then put you through fire and trials for 25 years, causing you to conform to the likeness of Christ. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image, the icon, the likeness of Jesus. That's when you're, he's being merciful to you when he deals with your heart. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose have I raised thee up. You didn't raise yourself up. I made you Pharaoh. And here's the purpose of your serving. That I might Show my power in thee. He said, the reason I raised you up, he said, I'm showing my power in you. And that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. When I get through destroying the largest army in the world, Pharaoh and his army, and I drowned him in the Red Sea, when I show all these miracles before Pharaoh and show him that all the gods of Egypt, from the first god that he mentions, the river being turned to blood, let's see your river god do something about this. To the last god of Egypt, which was the Pharaoh himself, when he killed his son and he didn't have a chance. There was no chance with God. This thing of chance is something man made up. There's no accidents in the Bible. Everything's exact. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will, he hardeneth. The word hardeneth there is the word scleruno, S-K-L-E-R-U-N-O. I don't know how men can't see this. It's just they're so proud and so strong, and they won't bow, and there's some big famous Baptist or big president of the Southern Baptist Convention, a whole string of them. We're so strong and so proud and we have our doctrine. You can't tell us that, Jim Brown. You're a nobody. That's exactly right. 
He's going to take the base things of the world to confound the wise and the things that are not to bring to naught the things that are so that no flesh can go in his sight there. In 1 Corinthians, that first chapter, starting in verse 26. Not many mighty, not many wise, not many noble in this world are called. He's not looking for noble people. He's not looking for mighty and wise people. He's looking for faithful men. Whether they stutter, you can be somebody small. I'm here to preach judgment to America and not to convert them because I don't believe God's going to convert them. God's got his elect family that will hear. That word scoreno means endure it, render stubborn. I have made him stubborn and strong with strength and full of pride. And he says, you care, your God came. Who do you think you are? Who do you think your God is? Not going to tell me what to do. I am the great Pharaoh. I am the God of Egypt. And God says, I'll kill you. And he did. He couldn't deliver himself, could he? Nope. The last God of Egypt that he destroyed was Pharaoh himself. Pharaoh was the God of Egypt. First God was a river, the fly God, the gnat gods. They had, they had, they had a frog-headed God. God says, get your frog God to get you out of this. Get your river God to get you out of this blood. Get your God of darkness to get you out of this darkness. You got all these other words that you have the word sclerotes means callousness. No feeling. S-K-L-E-R-O-T-E-S. Sclerotes, no feeling. Apathy. America is apathetic. You know what makes a man no feeling is the winds of doctrine. And the winds of doctrine are the doctrine of the devil. It's the doctrine of distributing fortunes, money, and things and stuff. That's what's made man's hearts endure it. It's made him calloused. It means to be calloused. It's a derivative of this word right here. I'm not going to go into all the verses on it, but callous. It means callousness. Just don't feel anything. The Bible says the doctrine of the devil will sear men's consciences. Over there in first, remember that? In First Timothy 4, we've been in First Timothy 4 and 1. In the latter time, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of daemonion, or distributing fortunes. And look what distributing fortunes does. It calluses a man. When a man gets rich and wealthy, the rich has many friends. That's what the Scripture tells us. They... But the wealth of the rich will not suffer him to sleep. He thinks day and night. He wants more. He cannot be satisfied with it. I mean, is Bill Gates satisfied? What's that? I don't remember. I'm, I'm going so fast here. Let me give this to you later because I'm, you get, I'm getting, when I get distracted, I don't remember what I said. And people ask me a lot of times, what did you just say? I say, I forget Saying too many things. All right. Now, 1 Timothy 4 1. The Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith, giving heat to seducing spirits and doctrines of daemonion or distributing fortunes. And the next verse says, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared as with a hot iron. Their consciences are seared. When you sear something, there's, it's callous, you don't feel anything. I climbed over a, a fence when I was about in the sixth grade to go get a baseball, and it cut. There's a scar right there. And I left my arm on the chain link fence, and you can see the scar. I went to the office, and I said, I think I need to go home. I never did cry over stuff. And she said, well, I guess you do, and they put a bandage on it. And I never was any, ever able to feel anything right there in that scar. When you're seared, you don't feel nothing. When the conscience is seared, you remember the conscience, sunitesis, it means to see with or see with the inner man, Christ. Their consciences become seared. They're, they don't have any feeling. When you listen to the doctrine of the devil, that's when your heart gets hardened. You're after money and things and stuff and, and houses and lands and position and applause. and That's what hardens a man's heart. God gave Pharaoh the power, and when he gave him the power, his heart was hardened. doesn't say God necessarily hardened his heart at the time that he was doing these things. He did give him a heart that could push himself forward at the moment. But if you're real strong in the flesh, you can't be humble to God. 
You have to humble to God in order for God to use you. But you can't because that word humble is a command. It's an imperative mood. Tepano, it means a level self. But you can't level self. He has to do it. It has to be God working in you. So when he commands us to do that, we will. it's kind of like saying, humble over your lifetime. And he gets you down here at the end of somewhere three quarters of the way to the end of your life. And you say, oh, well, I'm ready to serve God now. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth, verse 18. Thou wilt say then unto me, why doth he yet find fault? Boy, this all makes sense, doesn't it? Well, why is God finding fault if he hardens people and doesn't have compassion on others and he, and he does things to people that he, he wants to destroy them they never did anything wrong before they were born? That's not fair. You want fair? God will send us all to hell. Is that what you want? This is called mercy and grace. It's called grace, caris, unmerited favor. God picks out some people to favor. And that's his elect. And if he favors you, he favors you with trial and fire and tribulation. Unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe upon him, but also to suffer for his sake. The word given is the word my. It's a derivative of the word favor, of grace. It means to grant as a favor. God has granted you the favor to suffer for his sake. That's part of the grace of God in your life is to suffer for him and to be miserable sometimes. Everybody's got to be miserable somewhere sometime. Don't we? You get depressed? You're supposed to. <laughs> Welcome to the world of the elect. Do I get depressed? All this stuff going on in my head, and I get to thinking, Lord, nobody believes you, and I'll go for two and three weeks depressed, so depressed. I want to go find a hole and crawl in it and never come out. I wanted to get in my car and drive west and never stop. Just drive on into the ocean out there and just boom, 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 get out of here. But I can't. I have a duty. I want to quit like Jeremiah. I quit, God. I bet I can't. It's a burning in my heart. God, where's me a juniper tree? I'll sit down under it and I'll quit like Elijah quit. And God says, no, you won't. I didn't let him. But Lord, I'm tired. You ever got tired? I didn't feel like preaching tonight. But I do now. <laughs> and y'all know why. I love this book. This is medicine to me. Nay, but O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing form say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? You could talk back to God? God is not who men have made him out to be. He hardens Pharaoh's heart if that's he wants to because he wants to kill Pharaoh and his armies and he don't want to give them any kind of chance to believe him. And he don't want to give the Amalekites any chance to believe him. He don't want the Moabites any chance to believe him. And he don't want the Ammonites any chance to believe him. He's not going to give the Egyptian any chance to believe him in the Old Testament. But in Acts 2, he's going to pour out of his spirit, his truth on all flesh, and then he's going to give all those elect among those people all over the world not a chance. He's going to call them to be his elect. There's no such thing as a chance with God. Why hast thou made me thus? You're going to talk to God and say, why have you made me thus? Why did you make him that way? Why did you make my mother a vessel of wrath? Why did you make my father a vessel of wrath? Why can't all my family be saved? Well, he tells us here, hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump, referring back up here in the chapter to Jacob and Esau, the same lump out of the womb of their mother, Rebekah, to make one vessel unto honor Jacob and another unto dishonor Esau. Can God do that if he wants to? Great day in the morning. Why don't, who do people think God is? I don't know who you preachers think he is. <laughs> what? Santa Claus. They think he's Santa Claus. Hath not the part of power of the claim of the same lump to make one vessel to honor another and dishonor? It doesn't say what if. It says God willing in the original text to show the wrath of the people is actually what it says. He wants to show the wrath of these evil people just like he wanted to show Pharaoh's wrath. 
It's actually the word teorge. The O R G E. It's feminine gender. God's not a female. He wants to show Babylon mother all a harlotry on self. Let us make us a name. So he wants to show the wrath of the people to make his power known. He endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. Katortizo, fully accomplished. K A T A R T I Z O. Fully accomplished for destruction. God has these people being fully accomplished to be destroyed. Their natural brute beast, 2 Peter 2.12, made to be taken and destroyed. Born to be destroyed. Pharaoh was born to go to hell. He was born for. wasn't born for anything else. God, it's just like Judas. Jesus needed an evil man among his apostles, and he said, Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil. I needed a devil to do my work. I need Pharaoh to do my evil work. So I can be glorified when I destroy him. And he takes in that 14th chapter of Exodus. He has Pharaoh follow Moses and the children of Israel. After they're delivered through the Red Sea on the other side. And he takes them down into the bottom of the Red Sea. And God reaches down. I don't know if the Holy Spirit or what he did. Had some angels go down there and pull the chariot wheels of Pharaoh's off. And went, okay, can you swim? And comes this tidal wave from the distance. It was a wall of water on each side. A guy would be an idiot to ride, to share it down. Two great big walls of water. Probably 10, 15 miles away, he dried this thing up. And Moses gets to the other side. And they get out there in the middle of it. And here comes these tidal waves. They're saying, oh, my God, what are we into? <laughs> God says, I hope you brought you. Your surfboard with you is the biggest wave you're ever going to see. And that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he hath afore prepared to glory. Afore prepared prohetoimazo, P R O H E I O E T I O M A Z O. It means to fit up in advance. Same word, Ephesians 2.10. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained, proetomazo, that we should walk in them. Not God is for wish that we should walk in them. He's foreordained, and we will walk in his laws. And we are the vessels of wrath, vessels of mercy with you at the four prepared to glory. I don't know how in the world people get it. I hadn't mentioned Romans 9, but this is certainly a favorite chapter of mine. Now, gosh, I got so, how much time do I have, Mike? Let me go ahead and give you this in relationship. People saying, God can't harden Pharaoh's heart. Let's get back to this where he says, Thou wilt say then unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? Who art thou that replies against God? Shall the thing form say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power of the clay of the same lump? To make one vessel to honor another and dishonor, he can harden hearts. He can harden hearts when he wants to. He's God. He can send to hell who he wants to. If anybody goes to heaven, since there's none good and nobody seeks after God, if he doesn't ordain himself a family, nobody's going to heaven. If he don't drag his people in, nobody's going. If God don't drag you in, if he doesn't turn your head around, you know how he drags you in, he breaks your strength. He unhardens your heart. He takes away your heart of stone in the 36th chapter of Ezekiel and gives you a heart of flesh. Your heart's calloused against God because it's proud and it's strong and I'm young and I'm, and I'm look at me. I'm, it's tough being young, you know, especially when you know God's working on you. 73 is a real good age. If you get there, it's fun. I don't worry about what people say about me. I don't care what they like. I, I'm not interested in whether somebody writes me, you're a low-down lying preacher, and you said Billy Graham is a false teacher, and you said, I'm really worried. I'm too old to worry about you. Well, let me tell you all of my profundity and how profound I am and how brilliant I am. Jim, you need to change your message to what I'm saying. I ain't got time for you. 
God's called me to do this. I've been doing this for 50-something years. We had an old saying in the 40s, go fly a kite, you know. <laughs> and that's the way I feel. I would start telling people that come in here and say, go fly a kite. Take a walk. I've already heard that. <laughs> All right. Now, let me give you some of these others. People say God doesn't have a right to do what he wants to do. Look over here in Job 21. Job 21. I'll give you a couple of these. But this goes along with Pharaoh's heart being hardened, doesn't it? Because this is where it's quoted from. Job 21. And people who don't believe in predestination, that's ignorant. God said it. He said he ordained everything. He works all things after the counsel of his own will. You mean every good thing? No, everything. Sin and everything else. Satan can only do the amount of sin that God wants him to do. That's all the evil he can do. The wrath of man shall praise thee, and the remainder of your wrath shalt thou restrain. Look here. Job. 21. 22. Shall any teach God knowledge, seeing he judges those that are high? You going to tell God what to do? You going to tell God what his knowledge is? I think not. Jeremiah. Let me go to Job 33. Favorite verse of mine. Okay, I'll read that. One dieth in his full strength, being holy at ease and quiet. Frank Sinatra died in full strength and quiet. Went to hell. George Burns, famous old comedian out of the 30s and 40s, died at 100 years old just a few years back with a girl on each arm, cigar in his mouth, a cocktail in his hand, no conviction, nothing, in his full strength in Las Vegas, dies at 100 years old and goes to hell. They're not even saying, where am I going when I die? No thought of eternity in their full strength. When a man is strong, that's when his heart is hard. When he's strong in the flesh, whether it's politically, whether it's mentally, emotionally, physically, God has to break us to get our attention. Because man, by his very nature, is evil and wicked, and that's every man at his best state is altogether vanity. He ball, worthless. If God doesn't soften a man's heart, he will never believe God. And when I say believe, faith, that's the verb, that's believe is the verb, faith is the noun. I'm talking about obey God. Faith cometh by hearing. Hear and obey are the same word. Man won't obey God without God crushing him. He's got too much life in him, doesn't he? Huh? So do girls. Got too much. <coughs> what was I? <coughs> 33, Job 33. <coughs> People want to talk back to God and say, God can't do what he wants. You know what you're saying? You're saying he needs to account to you. God, you need to give me an account of your actions. Well, what does he say here? <clears throat> Verse 13. Why dost thou strive against God? For he giveth not account of any of his matters. Don't talk back to me. I'm God. People actually think they, that God owes them an explanation. That's what he's saying here. God don't owe anybody explanation for what he's doing. He says, I kill when I want to. I make alive when I want to. All through the Old Testament, he talks about the plagues coming from him and all the evil he'll bring on Jerusalem. He says, I will bring this evil. And you're telling me I can't? Don't talk back to me. Have you ever told your kids that? That's talking back to God, isn't it? What a God we serve. Huh? I can't hear you. All right, 14. For God speaketh once, yet twice, yea, twice, yet man perceiveth it not. What's two times for? Two witnesses. It takes two witnesses under Jewish law to declare anything. God speaks twice, and man don't even hear it. 
And not until God touches his heart, he won't, will he? Look at Job 9. Go to Job 9. There's much in the Bible about this. It's just too hard to get it all. Job 9. He's the one that this amazes me. Job answered and said, I know it is so of a truth, but how shall man be just with God? Man can't be just with God. God has to make him just. If he will contend with him, he cannot answer him one of a thousand. You're going to argue with God? He'll give you a thousand answers, and you won't be able to answer him one. He is a wise in heart, mighty in strength, who hath hardened himself against him, and hath prospered. The man that's wise in heart. And he's strong, he hardens himself. And God removes the mountains, and they know not, which overturneth them in his anger. Now remember, a mountain was a capital city of an empire. Which shaketh the earth out of her place, and the pillars thereof tremble. And God commandeth the sun, and it riseth not, and sealeth up the stars, which alone spreadeth out the heavens, and God treadeth upon the waves of the sea, and Jesus walked upon the water. God says, I defy all nature, which maketh Arcturus and Orion and Pleiades. We've got much to say about that. Don't have time to go there. And the chambers of the south, which doeth great things, past finding out, yea, and wonders without number. Lo, he goeth by me, and I see him not. Sometimes I don't even know that God is there. Is he a God afar off, and he doesn't know what's going on? No. He passeth on also, and I perceive him not. Behold, he taketh away. Who can hinder him? Who will say unto him, What doest thou, God? You're going to have question him? If the Bible says he kills people and he's got vessels of wrath and he doesn't love everybody and he hates all workers of iniquity, he loved Jacob and hated Esau, and he hates most people in the world, and you have to be an enemy of God to go to heaven, and you have to be an enemy of the world to go to heaven. You can't be friends with the world. If you're popular in the world, you're an enemy of God. And there's a cry of grief and damnation. Warn you when all men speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. If the world liked you and you can get the vote, whether it's a big preacher or a big... How in the world can you be telling the truth, Jim Brown? I'm telling you what the Bible says. I don't care how many people are not here. I don't care how many people in the world say different. We're in the apostasy. It's here. I don't hear anybody else preaching these things. I try to go in as much detail as I can when I'm teaching. Because there's so much of the Bible to learn, isn't there? Look over here in goodness. 1 Corinthians 20, uh, 2 and 16. I'm not going to go there. I'm running out of time. Who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? You're going to tell God what he can do about killing people, having vessels of wrath and vessels of mercy? It's not my business. If I could do away, like one writer said, with the doctrine in the Bible, if I could do away with it, I would do away with hell. But I don't have anything to say over it. If I could have my way, I would save everybody. But I can't have my way. I have to go against my feelings. If I could open that door, and right out that door right there was hell, and people were screaming and yelling, and there's this lava just turning and turning. You could see their bodies, and they were screaming their lungs out. Would you pull them out? I would certainly pull them out but God won't. See, we try to think that God thinks like we think. He says, your thoughts aren't my thoughts. You can't think like I think. I make a vessel of wrath, and I want him to die and go to hell, and he will. I don't care what you want. I have had to learn to read this book and believe it and go against my mother and my father and my sister and my brothers and my family and my grandfather and all the preachers I ever knew. If you're going to believe God, you believe this book and you go against it. Don't say, let me ask my preacher what he thinks. I'll give somebody, a, a young person, a, a waitress, a, a DVD, and she'll say, I'm going to give this to my mother and father. I say, you better not because they'll tell you that I don't know what I'm talking about, but you better watch that. That's your eternal soul involved in that. Well, they're Pentecostals. Well, they certainly don't know any truth. Well, they're Baptists. They don't either. Not the ones today, though. 150 years ago, the Baptists were teaching what I'm teaching. The Presbyterians were teaching what I'm teaching. Nobody's teaching it today, are they? Whew. God help us. 
I'm just tired of a world that doesn't believe God. Look at Isaiah 64, one of my favorite, favorite verses. People say, God can't do what he wants. We're nothing but clay, aren't we? You mean a man can take a clay, some clay on a, a potter's wheel and pump that wheel and mold it to what he wants to, and the clay has a right to say back to him, what are you doing to me? Going to make him a chamber pot or make him a vase, one a vessel of wrath and one a vessel of mercy, one a good vessel, one a bad. Isaiah 64. I love this right here because this kind of says it like it is. Isaiah 64. I'm thumbing. I'm talking, not thumbing. 64. And I love this. Verse 6, but we are all as an unclean thing and all our righteousness are as filthy rags. That word filthy rags, E.D. means a menstrual cloth. That was one of the filthy things among Israel. We're not trying to be crude. That's just the woman had to separate. She had a separating period during the time of her cycle. And we do all fate as a leaf and our iniquities like the wind and have taken us away. And there is none that calleth upon thy name. There's no such thing as a sinner's prayer for salvation. We know that God heareth not sinners. If any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth in John 9, 31. Yes, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, but how shall they call on him in whom they not believe? Belief is the method of salvation. There is none that calleth upon thy name that stirreth up himself. Or, as the word stirreth up, means to wake from the dead. You're dead in sin, and you're going to wake yourself up to call upon God. There's none that wakes himself from the dead to take hold of thee, for thou hast hid thy face from us and hast consumed us because of our iniquities. But now, O Lord, thou art our father, we are the clay, and thou our potter, and we all are the work of thy hands, every one of us. Men that don't believe that don't believe God. You have to take a lot of crucifying to believe God, but you can't do it if God don't deal with your heart. You can't. Jeremiah, won't. Jeremiah. gosh, I got so many. Jeremiah 18, one book over, Jeremiah 18. I read this, I'm going to run out. So whenever the Bible says God can't harden men's hearts, he hardens every man's heart. That's a vessel of wrath fitted to destruction. He makes them strong in their minds. You can be a drunk down on Broadway and be strong about how much booze you can drink, how drunk you can get. Jeremiah 18. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. Then went down to the potter's house. We're not talking about T.D. Jake's false church. And behold, he wrought a work on the wheels, and the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter, so he made it again. When he beats us down on the potter's wheel, he's getting the impurities out of the clay, bubbles in it and cracks in it. Another vessel has seemed good to the potter to make. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter as I please? Is that my privilege as God? Saith the Lord, behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in mine hand, O house of Israel. You can't do what you want. Man devises his way, but God directs his steps. You had this way and God says, get over here. My whole life has been God guiding my, directing my steps because I've done all this plotting and scheming and nothing has turned out the way I planned it, but I'm happier than I ever thought I could be. God will make you happier His way than you could possibly even ever think to make you happy your way as a believer. And He's going to. It's not a matter of whether you're going to let Him. He's going to do that. Look at Isaiah 40. Isaiah 40. These are verses about <laughs> you're going to tell God what to do. Job said, can we order God around because we can't order God around because of darkness of speech. He said, we, don't, we have darkness in us. How are we going to tell him what to do? Isaiah 40. About how much time do I have? Three minutes. Look here. Isaiah 40. Verse 12. Who hath measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? That's God. And made it out to heaven with a span. And comprehend the dust of the earth in a measure, and weigh the mountains and scales and hills in a balance. 
who hath directed the Spirit of the Lord of being his counsel has taught him. You're going to teach God what he needs to do? You're going to tell God, you can't do this. Who art thou that replies against God? Look at Isaiah 45. Isaiah 45. Isaiah has much to say about this. Verse 9. He says, I form light and create darkness and make peace and create evil. In verse 7, I create evil, God says. If, I want to, if there's going to be evil, I have to create it. He does everything. Verse 9. Warn him that striveth with his maker. Let the potsherd strive with the potsherds of the earth. Potsherd was a broken piece of pottery that was worth nothing. Let these vessels of wrath strive with each other. Shall the clay say to him that fashioneth it, What are you making, God? What makest thou? Or thy work? He hath no hands. Uh, God, you fixed this one wrong and that one over here wrong. And God, I think I, I need to tell you what to do today, God. Isn't this amazing that people, I don't know why people don't know these things are here. Do you? I got so many more of these. Job 37. 37. How men can believe that God is, they think God is who they think he is. He's not. He's God. He does everything he pleases to do. All the wars, all the evil, all the cancer, all the sin, everything's going on. He kills people and he's righteous. We, for, he kills people for whatever his reasons are and he's righteous. We kill people for our reasons and it's murder. Now, don't try to explain that. That's the way God laid it down. What did I say, Isaiah, or Job? Job 37. 37, verse 19, I believe it is. Teach us what we shall say unto him, for we cannot order our speech by reason of darkness. We don't even know what to say to God. Look at... Chapter 38, verse 1 and 2. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? You don't even have any knowledge. And you're going to hide my counsel? And you don't even know what's going on? This thing of the Bible is one big, huge mosaic. It's one picture. He doesn't love everybody. He loved his wife, the church, and gave himself for her and nobody else. He didn't die for everybody. If he did, everybody's going to heaven. I've run out of time. I'm coming back. I had to put this in with God hardening Pharaoh's heart. He hardened him. If you notice, he hardened him with strength. The stronger a person is, the harder he is. The stronger he is physically. You think you can take one of these big... NFL running backs and humble him? Or, or what's his name? He used to be the big, big wide receiver of San Francisco. Uh, Jerry Rice. One of the filthiest mouth men I've ever heard talk in my life in an interview. Dirty mouth. Looks like a nice guy. Holds the record for all the passes, wide receivers. What do you think he'd have to do to Jerry Rice to humble him? with all his records he holds. He'd have to kill him or blind him or do something to him. Break his neck. Or it don't matter who they are, Tom Brady or even the Manning brothers, as good as they are. What do God have to do to them? And they seem kind of humble. Some of them don't. Some are smart addicts. See how wonderful I am. You get on the top of the world... It's a long way down to, to humility, isn't it? And people don't want down there. Let's pray. Father, thank you for truth. Thank you for your word. You are truly God. Thank you for revealing this to us, Lord. Lord, I thank you and praise you for weakening me physically through the years because I used to be very arrogant and haughty and lifted up, even though I didn't even know that's what it was. Lord, it seems to be that our haughtiness is just our strength. 
We're so strong, we strong willed, and we won't be brought down. But Lord, it's just like you said to Edom, I'll bring thee down. Thank you for truth. Lead us to paths of righteousness every day, strengthen the flock, mature the sheep. We'll give you praise for everything. Lead us to your elect in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> I hadn't just hit hard with predestination a long time, but that was as hard as it gets. I didn't mean to interrupt you. You said that um, a rich man has many friends and is not satisfied with his wealth. Yeah, I've got all kinds of verses on that. I don't recall exactly. A friend, let me see here. I've got it right here, I think. Uh, it's in Proverbs here. The rich has many friends. It's uh, right in this section right here. I forget the exact verse. But the rich... I know where it is in my Bible. It's right on this section right here. I'll find it for you. I'll give a list of them. I've got a whole list of these. The rich have many friends. The rich, people go after the rich. They like them. Oh, yeah. I know a rich guy, and trust me, he is no. I, I, I know many, many rich men and in here know, in Nashville. The thing about it is he hates me because I don't respect him. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I don't respect any rich because the rich are lifted up. They're yeah. proud. They're, they're arrogant. Yeah, but I'm saying everybody respects him because he's a millionaire. I treat him just like.